Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Faye. Uh, I'll be your, ho your host today. Um, so today this session is insights from Kaggle masters and experts on competitive AI and LM frontiers. So uh, make sure that you're in the right session. Um, so we'll have uh, time for questions uh, at the end of the session. So you're welcome to submit your questions on the uh, Envy uh, app and uh, or ask questions in one of the IELTS microphones. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll give you the floor to the speakers. Thank you. Great, thanks, Faye. Um, hi, everybody. My name is David Austin. I'm a Kaggle Grandmaster and work at NVIDIA. Uh, fortunate enough to spend some of my time at NVIDIA working on AI competitions and uh, learning a lot of new techniques, methods, and we're here to share a lot of those with you today. Um, a big thing that we like to do is apply what we learn to whether it's competitions or taking something out of research and, and putting it in an application domain. So we're gonna talk about a lot of different topics around uh, LLMs, vision, generative AI, uh, competitive AI, uh, but the real slant today is gonna be around how do we take all these cool things that are happening in the world today and apply them to real problems. Uh, we will leave time at the end for questions, so if you came with, with a question that, that, that we didn't address, please feel free to ask it. There's also a Meet the Expert session at two o'clock where you can come talk to us one-on-one. -on -one. So one way or another, you can get your questions uh, answered at, at some point today. Um, but first, I'd like to uh, introduce my, my panel of, of colleagues here. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, Jiwei. Hello, everyone. My name is Jiwei Liu. I'm a data scientist and software developer from the large language model technology team. I'm working on code generation, retrieval augmented generation, uh, I'm also a Kaggle Grandmaster. I used to work a lot on the computations. Uh, before all the LM stuff, uh, I'm working on Rapids, which is a GPU accelerated data science framework. Nice to meet you all. Great, and, uh, yeah. uh, and, and Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Diat. I'm a senior data scientist at NVIDIA. I have a PhD in mathematics with a specialization in computational science. I love doing data science competitions, and I'm currently a quadruple Kaggle Grandmaster. <laughs> and uh, next we have Laura. Uh, yeah, hello, I'm Laura Leal Teche. I'm a research manager at NVIDIA. Before I was a professor at the Technical University in Munich in Germany. And uh, my research group is interested in perception, dynamic scene understanding, and so today I will talk a lot about LLMs and their interaction with vision systems. And lastly, we have uh, Kazuki. Hi, uh, I'm Kazuki Onodera, and I'm also Kaga Grandmaster, and I joined this team four years ago, uh, and my expertise is recommended system. Thank you. Thanks, Kazuki, and thanks for coming in from Japan for, uh, for this talk. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you know, probably the hottest topic that, that we've heard at the, at the conference and that we're seeing evolve in the, the competition space is, is around LLMs and specifically the large generative models. So, so Jiwei, maybe you could start us off talking about a little bit about these generative models, how they work, how they're trained, how, how we use them. Yeah, of course. So uh, training a large language model or AI chatbot like ChatGPT is a very compute intensive task and it is a multi-stage process. So the first stage is pre-training a foundation language model. So basically we collect massive text data from the internet and train the model to imitate the human language to learn how to complete documents. Um, the second step is what we call supervised fine tuning. So basically, we want to curate a smaller but high quality data set um, you know, by human labelers for specific use cases like chatbots, QA, create, creative or professional writing or coding. So when we have these uh, smaller high quality data sets, we apply the same language modeling to continually, continuously train the model. The third step is called RLHF, so reinforcement learning from human feedback, or you know, um, DPO, like direct preference optimization. So the goal is basically the same as the second step, but it is from a more, I mean, a cheaper and easier data set, like use, user feedback uh, in terms of preferences. 
So it's usually a binary, uh, binary signal to tell us like uh, the chatbot generates two, an two answers for the same question. So which one is more helpful, useful, or better? So this preference uh, give, give us a feedback and we continuously train the model. So lastly, we could apply a guardrail to the model to prevent it from generating any toxic or harmful uh, information. So yeah, that's how we train the chatbot. Right, right. So a lot going on there, a lot we could do with them. We see them used a lot in competitions today, but it was not long ago that there was another family of models that was probably the most prevalently used, and I don't know of anybody that used them more than Chris in, in competitions, and that's really more the BERT style of models where you know we need additional context. So Chris, could you talk to us a little bit about BERT and how that compares to some of the LLMs that we're using today? Yeah, certainly. So there's a lot of lo language models out there, even more so than the, than the chatbots, and it gets really confusing. <clears throat> they basically fall into three families. There's models like GPT, which stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. There's models like BERT, which is a bi-directional encoding representative transformer, and there's models that are full architecture transformers like T5. And the difference between the groups, uh, <clears throat> the first major difference is how they're pre-trained, right? So before you fine-tune uh, a model on your specific task, it's pre-trained on billions of texts to get a general understanding of language. <clears throat> and BERT is pre-trained by showing it lots of text and then randomly words are hidden and then BERT needs to use, uh, the BERT models like, like BERT need to use the words before and after the hidden words to try to guess what the, what the hidden word is. This is an auto-encoding task and as such, BERT understands vocabulary very well, structure, semantics. Now, GPT-like models, when, during their pre-training, they see a lot of text and they need to predict the next word. So as such, they're very good at flow and what comes next. And then, in addition to the differences in pre-training, there's also differences in the architecture. So a full transformer has an encoder and a decoder, and this is group three, models like T5. Now, BERT, it's just an o encoder, so you input text and it goes through a series of self-attention layers and out comes a mathematical vector called an embedding. And that embedding represents the text. Now GPT, it's just the decoder. So you put in an embedding and then after a series of layers, out comes text. So you can see there's lots of different LLMs, there's a lot of different differences, and as such, uh, they're all, they all excel at different tasks. Right, so, so there's, there's constantly gonna be the different need for encoder, decoder types of models, just depending on the application. Kazuki, could you maybe talk a little bit about what are some of those applications when you would use the encoder versus decoder type of models? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, sp speaking of BERT, um, there are some cargo competition uh, where BERT was used. Um, the, one of the competition's goal is to evaluate student summary and the other competition's goal is to evaluate complexity of the passages. So, so both tasks require to evaluate and classify the sentences. I think this, these are the good example of use case of BERT because BERT is very good at classifying that. Unlike BERT, GPT is used for generating sentences. So, uh, so it's like a chatbot. I think, uh, for me, I'm using GPT for generating simple code. Uh, when I say, uh, can you show me the example of the PyTorch DDP? Um, and GPT returns the example. So I, I often hear the people say, they don't want to any coding without GPT. So, so I think those uh, the BERT and GPT is very different. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, there's applications for both. The cool thing is, it's not just limited to the LLM and, and NLP space, right? I mean, we can actually apply these LLMs in other areas. My background is in vision, and it, I'm seeing some really cool stuff happen in the vision space uh, as, as we're using language models. So, Laura, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What, what are you seeing in, in, in terms of that? Yeah. Um, so definitely LLMs have had a, a huge impact in vision and in particular in the way that we interact with our vision systems, right? So before LLMs made this you know, big splash, 
we were not even thinking about interacting with our vision systems using natural language, right? Um, so th this was kind of made possible uh, by, by CLIP, um, which was the first or one of the first algorithms that said, oh, how about we align the text modality with the image modality, right? So Chris explained before like how to obtain this embedding from text. And now the idea of CLIP would be to obtain an embedding from an image and kind of uh, put these two together in the same uh, embedding space if they represent the same object. For example, you know, you have the text dog and you have an image of a dog. You want to put these two embeddings closer together. And um, well, how, how do you train such a system, right? So you need a bunch of images where there's corresponding captions, so a caption that actually explains the content of the image, and then you train the system to align the embeddings. So what is cool now is that you can go from one modality to the other, and you can do really nice things. You can talk to your vision system using natural language, which has really you know, allowed us to think bigger um, how, to, how to apply our vision systems to much more, for example, categories, you know, think beyond um, the cars and pedestrians that we're detecting, that we're segmenting, and really thinking big in terms of natural language. So I think the perspective has really changed with LLMs. Yeah, this idea of bringing embeddings from different modalities into a common embedding space is just opens up so many possibilities and, and, and very powerful. I mean, what capabilities are you seeing that, that that's opening up? So um, for us, we're interested in perception, um, as I said before, and um, LLMs uh, allowed us to do what we now call open world uh, scene understanding, for example. So you take um, the task of semantic segmentation, right? Before, what we used to do is grab, you know, a certain number of classes that we were interested in. If you're in, interested in, in autonomous vehicles, you want to detect and segment uh, pedestrians, cars, road, etc. So there were this fixed set of classes, and we were training our systems to segment, you know, once you get an image, segment and, and assign a label, uh, but there were this fixed set of labels, right? Nowadays with LLMs, uh, the perspective has changed, right? I mean, before it was, okay, how, how do I scale up such a system to, you know, the infinite number of objects that we can find in the world? It was not a clear path forward, now with LLMs, we actually see a path forward, right? I mean, the idea is that you actually use prompts, you use your natural language to express what you want to find in the image, and the vision system needs to segment anything that you prompt, right? Like fire hydrants, dogs, cows, whatever, not only a set of predefined classes. Um, so I think th this was a way of doing actually this open world um, semantic segmentation or scene understanding, so completely different game to what we we're doing before. Um, and then, of course, like LLMs have also changed the way uh, we do, for example, generative AI, right? Um, so we have now things like DALI or Mid Journey that leverage um, these alignment capabilities of CLIP that I was that I was telling about before. And so, for example, you have DALI that takes now this text embedding and using, using a diffusion model, it generates an image that represents what you describe in the text, right? So you have probably seen these demos where you kind of write, you know, there's a polar bear on a skateboard in Times Square, and you get this nicely generated image of, of exactly what you have described. Um, so I think this, this open up endless possibilities for designers, for artists, and in general, for the public to interact with these vision systems because now everything is through natural language. So I think this opens up tons of possibilities. Yeah, and it, for those of us working on competitions, we're always looking for, you know, what, what is that next thing and, you know, what is the next edge that we can get uh, uh, and some of those, those, those uh, capabilities you're talking about are really exciting. I mean, what do you think's next? Like, what, what are the next frontiers that, that we're talking about here with vision and LLMs? Mm -hmm. Um, well, we've only started exploring um, text and image, right? So, but there's tons of other modalities. Without going too much further away, uh, we have videos. We have seen now things like Zora, for example, that is generating videos from text. Um, but there's still tons to explore, right? So there's a question of, you know, how temporally coherent those videos are, um, or, for example, the captions that are used um, to train these models, because it's, it's the same idea um, as with CLIP, right? You want to align a video with a caption explaining the content of the video. 
But the question is if this caption actually explains only what is in the video in terms of objects or also describes motion, describes actions, right? Um, so, so I think there's a whole new um, like research field to explore what kind of captions we use to train these systems and how temporally coherent our videos are going to be. There's a lot of work that is going to appear now um, in this area, I think. And then there's also the whole 3D world, right? I mean, we have other senses. We have, for example, LiDAR. And we also want to align geometric features with language, with images, right? So I think um, there's really tons to explore in, in different modalities. We have been working, for example, on, on LiDAR and trying to prompt um, objects in the LiDAR space using geometrical features, using shape features. Um, so I think it's going to be super exciting because now uh, we're going to be able to generate, for example, full objects in 3D using text prompts. Um, so there's tons and tons that is going to, um, to appear, I think, in the upcoming years. Yeah, yeah, really exciting stuff. Um, you, know, you know, starting to bring it uh, into the uh, competition space a little bit. You know, it wasn't that long ago where uh, you know the things that, that wowed us a little bit were, were things like retrievers, where you could just retrieve images and or, or retrieve text and, and, and get commonalities. But uh, now with generative AI, that's that's become we've been able to move far beyond that. And actually, we can combine the two concepts. Um, and so there's this thing now called RAG. Everybody's talking about RAG this, RAG that. Chris, why don't you demystify RAG a little bit? Tell us what what, what is RAG and, and how's it used. Okay, so RAG is a really cool technique uh, that extends the capabilities of LLM, and it stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. So if you ask um, a basic chatbot a question, then it's gonna answer that question from its memory, what it, um, what it already knows. When you use RAG, you have an LLM and a set of documents. So then you ask a question, and the first step is uh, we search all the documents for chunks of text that relate to the question. And then we give both the question and all those helping chunks of text to the LLM, looks at it all, and then it gives an answer. And this happens all without, without us even knowing. But as such, the answer comes back and it's so much more accurate. And I had a chance to experience this in a recent Kaggle competition called the LLM Science Exam. And we were challenged uh, to build a system that could answer multiple choice science exam questions. And we were limited because, limited in how big uh, the language model can be, and there was also time constraints and resource constraints. So as such, uh, we couldn't submit a model, say, as big as chat GPT, which may already have a lot of the knowledge in its memory, but um, we had to sort of submit smaller models. So uh, the solutions that won this competition were RAG. And specifically, people were submitting models and at the same time they'd submit a set of documents. Specifically, they submit all, of, all six million Wikipedia articles. They submitted all together. And then what their code would do is, when it, was, when it was about to answer a science exam question, it would first scan all six million articles in the blink of an eye and find any text that relate to the question and then it would feed that help, that help the full information plus the question to the LLM, and then it would give back an answer. And I witnessed this firsthand because on my computer, I would just make, I would just make challenging questions, right? I would make a question about quantum physics, about a specific detail or a number, and think no way would it find it. Um, but sure enough, you know, in the blink of an eye, it would come back uh, with the answer. And it was something like, I forget, 97, 98% correct. So it's truly incredible what these RAG systems can do. And the most impressive thing is all of this is just happening behind the scenes, right? You're just asking a question and answers are coming back and it's doing the retrieval and all that kind of stuff and it's just all in the blink of an eye. It's really amazing. Yeah, yeah, and for those of you who might be interested in finding out more about that or seeing this this in action, Chris published some really great notebooks that were you know, some of the high, highest voted ones in Kaggle uh, a few months back during, during this competition. So you can go and check those out and see how he trained RAG, how he did inference with RAG, um, but, but really, r really good stuff. Um, Kazuki, uh, you know, so Chris talked about a couple things there. He talked about retrieval, uh, he talked about LLMs doing, doing some generation. How, how do you balance those? I mean, is one more important than the other? Like, like how, do, how do you view the trade-off between retrieval and, and uh, the LLMs? Yeah, uh, let, let, let me talk about this uh, talk, topic for, for uh, as uh, RAG and fine-tune. 
uh, there are some papers that comparing about uh, that rug and fine tune. So, and both, uh, uh, almost of all papers shows that rug is better than fine tune because the fine tune is very difficult method to apply uh, due to the catastrophic forgetting. That means when you want to train new things, uh, something like latest news, um, of course you can do that, but uh, the model often forget all the things. So more than that, RAG is very cost effective um, comparing to fine tune because uh, fine tune needs a lot of computing resource. So yeah, uh, uh, so, but I think uh, it's worth to try the, the, the fine tune when you want uh, specialized understanding. And also I think, uh, yeah, I, I think we should uh, find the sweet spot between uh, saving money and meeting requirements. Yeah, so basically RAG is something that can make LLMs even better than the LLM itself. Mm -hmm. and, and based on what you're saying, you know, it could be cheaper as well, right? Mm -hmm. Not having to fine tune models and, and get additional data and it can be more efficient. So. So that's that's obviously very powerful, um, but it, it, you know something. Of course, we're interested in is the applications of that. So, so Jiwei, what, what are you seeing in terms of you know different applications for for RAG right now? Yeah. So um, I think there are two kinds of interesting applications using RAG. So the first is to uh, protect privacy. So we all have a lot of uh, private data, either personal or enterprise, so which we don't want to share online. Um, and what we can do is to bring the LLM to a local controlled environment, like we deploy an open source LLM and we create a vector database, like an embedding uh, model, and uh, yeah, so specifically like a rack system, uh, connecting our local, our private data to this local deployed LLM. So this is a talk to your data experience, so it leverages the capability of LLM while protecting you know, the privacy uh, of the data. We actually have two demos you can interact with. Uh, uh, on the second floor, the demo booth, we have the chat with RTX. So basically it's a, um, you know, just the deploy on the, on the Windows laptop. So you could, you could talk to some PDI files, some other kinds of files uh, using large language models. Another demo is uh, talk to your data with Nemo agent. So whenever you have a question, so it, it, there's an agent which can route the question to a unstructured uh, ag uh, text agent or to a structured SQL retriever and synthesize the answer and get back to you. So I think this, these are uh, quite interesting uh, uh, privacy protecting uh, kind of demos. Uh, the second kind of applications I think is to enhance like the recency of the, you know, of the, uh, the use cases. Uh, for example, like a news or a finance agent or a search, LLM empowered search uh, and also Copilot, so which you know uh, it process like real time streaming data, and uh, you know and help us uh, accomplish accomplish tasks like replying an email, helping me writing a short summary of the conference, or you know uh, writing code. So yeah, I think those are the interesting applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The applications are, are just limitless. Uh, so you know, we've been talking about applications of for just LLMs and RAGs and this uh, you know common embedding space between vision and LLMs and some hot areas. Um, you know, I'm interested. I know we, we all are. Well, how can you take these things and actually apply them in, in the competition yeah. space? Um, so you know, as such, with these new technologies, it seems like competitions are starting to change a little bit. Like for example, you know, we're seeing LLM competitions where you know there's no data provided or one data point, and you've got to generate your own data. We're starting to see see changes there. Jiwei, what what other changes are you seeing in the the competition space? Yeah. So just like you mentioned, so I think a very interesting trend uh, in the Kaggle competitions is there are more and more computations which don't provide any training data at all or provide very little training data, which is not enough to train a powerful like predictive model. So what it, the challenge here is it asks all the participants to come up with uh, novel ideas and solutions to collect your own data, curate your own training data. 
Uh, this is actually a very critical step for any machine learning tasks. But you know, previously, uh, on Kaggle at least, so the training data is fixed. So and there's, it's very hard or impossible to expand the training data. But now, uh, we are seeing more and more uh, use cases where you know, uh, participants uh, leverage LLM to generate training data, and uh, this, which creates actually a great computational uh, edge advantage to win a computation. So um, yeah, so actually I expect, this, it's also very cost effective, so comparing, comparing to like hand labeling. So I expect more uh, such computations, and I think this skill is actually quite useful for other tasks outside computations. Yeah, 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 totally agree. Um, you know, another area where we're seeing, you know, the application of some of these things that we weren't seeing before in the common space is maybe in uh, Rexus. And Chris, I know you've done a lot of work in, in Rexus before. Have you had a chance to use uh, LLMs with, with Rexus problems? Yeah, we have. So uh, as LLMs are being developed, we're actually seeing them uh, improve all other areas of AI. And, and Laura had spoke how it's helping with vision. But another example is recommender systems, right? So recommender systems are you go onto an online shopping site and it'll suggest something you might like or a streaming uh, video uh, website and it su suggests movies. So the way recommender systems work is there's users and items and it attempts to recommend an item the user uh, is going to like. And typical ways of solving this are you could uh, look at the items that a user previously uh, engaged with, and then you can find items that are similar to those items. Uh, or you could look at a user and find other users that are similar to that user, and then see what items they like. Or lastly, you can find patterns uh, between users uh, and the items they engage with. The way LLMs help is if you remember, we had mentioned how uh, a model like BERT uh, can encode a block of text. So items can be represented by their uh, text description. And we could take that description and then we can encode it into an embedding. And embedding is like a point in space, a little dot. And when you encode all of the items, you have all these dots. And then we can find which items are similar by just finding which dots are the closest. Right? So it now gives us a new way to find similar items. Likewise, we can apply that to users. And lastly, by using these embeddings, these dots, we can actually find patterns between users and embeddings uh, in this, sorry, patterns between users and items in this embedding space. Uh, so using LLMs is, is really helping us make more accurate recommender systems. Right, and I think actually you were able to use this in a recent KDD Cup competition, right? Maybe you could tell us about that. Yeah, so we did. So um, recently I teamed up with a bunch of uh, co-workers and we entered the prestigious annual KDD Cup, which uh, it was in 2023, and the task it was hosted by Amazon, and the task was to build three recommender systems. So when you visit, uh, so the, you can visit the Amazon website in different countries, and the, and, the, and the website's in different languages, and what the tasks were is we had to build a recommender system uh, for languages where we have lots of data, then we had to build a recommender system for underrepresented languages, not a lot of data, and then lastly, we had to build a recommender system which would recommend products that do not exist yet. So, uh, yeah, interesting challenge. So our, our, uh, so our solution used large language models, and specifically, we used embeddings to find similar items, and then furthermore, embeddings allowed us to do something else, which is when we found patterns uh, in the languages which had lots of data, uh, via transfer learning or translation, because we're working in an embedding language space, we're, we're able to transfer those patterns uh, to uh, apply them to the recommender system for the underrepresented languages. And that gave us a huge edge there. And then in the third task, and you kind of use models like BERT, which is the encoder for that, and then for the third task, where we had to gener gener uh, generate um, potential items that don't even exist yet, we use models like GPT, uh, which would, you know, base, you start with an embedding of items that uh, users like, and then it'll generate uh, text descriptions of products that don't even exist. So using, so using language models <coughs> allowed us, and then we also combine that with, with classical techniques, and it allowed us to make very accurate models, and we actually, the NVIDIA team actually won first place 
and it was like three mini competitions, and we won first place in every single competition. I saw you get ready to clap, you can clap. <laughs> 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 so, so we were super excited about that, and it was a, a great demonstration of just the power of LLMs helping out with other forms of AI. Yeah, so that's a great example of how you know, some of these new technologies that are coming in can be applied not only in the real world, like some of the applications we talked about, but also in, in, in the competition. So clearly seeing changes in that space. So, so Kazuki, I, I mean, where is this headed? Where, where, what do you see as in the future of competitions? How might they look different in the future? Uh, yeah, I think LLM it would be more powerful tool for human annotators. Uh, they can speed up their annotation process by taking over augmentation uh, uh, and uh, suggesting levels. Uh, in other words, they can uh, more focusing fo they, they can focus on uh, more essential tasks, uh, which is exactly what the organizer looking for. So, uh, yeah, I think as a uh, I, I think in, mm, more than that, uh, the machine learning models will be more accurate and robust using that high quality data. Also, I think it makes uh, CV and LB more reliable. Yeah, yeah, which goes back to what Jiwei was talking about, about you know, the, the problem with data, and now we can use LLMs to, to do more with data and, and annotation and, and with the generation. So certainly that, that should be a change that we should be looking out for. So great. Well, so, so we covered a lot of topics today, uh, you know, some, some of the latest technologies, how we're using them, how we apply them, how they could be used in competitions. Uh, but we'd love to hear from you. Any questions that, that you have uh, for us about any of these topics or, or anything beyond? We'd be happy to take questions. Is it working? Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for the awesome uh, panel. Uh, the question I have about the future of uh, machine learning competitions. In the past, if you participated in machine learning competition, there was a chance you would contribute to the state-of-the-art research. AlexNet would be a perfect example. And to do that, the barrier to, to entry was pretty low. You just need the computer with the GPU, and you basically had to be smart. That's it. Now, cutting edge research, state of the art research, requires you to train large models, which is at least a few million dollars, and the cluster of computers, and not everyone in this room has access to that kind of resources. So do you think that in the future, the machine learning competitions will still provide a venue for discovering uh, cutting edge breakthroughs and state of the art uh, developments? or it will become kind of marginalized and mostly the venue for uh, recruitment and kind of place for people to, to enjoy their hobbies. Sure, yeah, may, I'll start with that and, and, and maybe somebody else won't want to contribute. So, so there's a self-regulating factor involved there, which is uh, the amount of compute that you have for inference, okay? So you can go off and train the, these advanced models, but, but the way competitions are working today is they're mostly code competitions, so you have to commit your code to an inference server that has a limited compute envelope. So what we're seeing is a lot of neat innovations on how you can you know, compress these models, how you can quantize them, how you can get them to run in this limited envelope. And I think that's the factor that normalizes the playing field a little bit and not make it just about who's got the most compute. Because if it was about that and you just had to submit a static you know, CSV file with your, your um, with your solution, then I think the premise of your question it, it would be exactly right, is that this would just go to who, who has the most compute shall win. Um, but that's not the case. And we're seeing some actually, I think, some really innovative things, even beyond necessarily the scope or the intent of the actual competition that's going into this efficiency problem, because everybody's trying to take advantage of the latest and greatest and state of the art. But how you can compress that into a limited compute envelope that everybody has access to, that becomes almost a challenge in and of itself. Yeah, I can add. So, I think uh, I think even now, so uh, all the machine learning computations can still contribute to the state of the art research. Uh, I think two examples are first the mixture of experts. So, if you if you take a look at the Hugging Face Open LLM leaderboard, many of the top entries are actually created by uh, mixing uh, several 
language models, so in an innovative way. So it's actually pretty, uh, it's not that uh, computing intensive as one assumes. So it can be done on the, on the laptop or you, uh, even on a single GPU, it's possible. And uh, you know, it's like an ensemble of LLMs. Uh, a second example is, so there are approaches like uh, the QLaura, so the quantized uh, low rank adapters. So you know, it's also like you just train a very small adapter. So even though the LLM are, have billions of parameters, the adapter is actually, high, it's just megabytes, in terms of megabytes. So in some cases, it can greatly enhance the capability of the LLM, so in a low cost way. Thank you. We have the next question. Yeah, great uh, talk, by the way. Um, so I have a question about um, about the third part of the competition that you guys were mentioning that you guys won. I felt like you kind of skipped a step. You're talking about you take the embeddings and then use embeddings to make recommendations on new products. And I, I, I didn't really understand the jump between the embeddings and the recommendations. Could you expand on that? Yeah, that, that. yeah so, um, so let's say a user previously uh, browsed uh, a bunch of uh, black shirts. So basically, uh, as a, 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 a good assumption of what they would like in the future is maybe uh, more shirts. They're obviously interested in shirts, and maybe they like the color black. So you basically pick items that are similar to their history of items. So the process of an embedding, we can take the, the text description, uh, you know, a collared shirt well, made of this material, that I see. So you take the check, text description, and, and embedding is essentially a mathematical vector. It's a dot. And then we can take all, every other item on the website, we, can, we embed them into dots. And what will happen is in this embedding space, all the dots that are close to the black shirt will most likely be other, shir other shirts and also sim things of similar color. So all the dots will like cluster. So that's the thing. We look at, we look at the, 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 their previous items, which are a bunch of dots, and then we pick, and then for what we recommend is we recommend uh, dots that are close by. But, but no, but I'm sorry. Um, maybe I didn't describe myself very well. Uh, so how do you come up with new ideas for new products based on that? Oh, you mean the third task, the yeah. generative AI one? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, yes. okay. Well, so the generative AI one is um, once you have an embedding of products they have, you could just as one example is you can maybe take five of their previous products, you could um, maybe average that and get sort of an average embedding, and then you run uh, a decoder. So you put that embedding in, and then it'll basically try, attempt to convert that embedding into which product it was. Uh, but since you um, essentially generated sort of a new embedding, uh, then it basically, it, it'll write a description, but it, it's not a description that actually exists. So, okay, I, sorry, I'm, so many questions. Okay, I apologize for taking a little time. How do you, when you average, when you average the embedding, so what do you do next to get the description? I'm, that's the step I'm not really sure about. How do you go from embedding to description? I see. Well, you basically, so the model will be, so you have to fine tune the model. So basically, you have to have a lot of data where you have embeddings and you have the text description. And then you will fine tune, you'll basically train, train the model to do the conversion for you, to convert a, an embedding to text. And you train on all that. And then the way a model generalizes is you can give it a new embedding that it has never seen before and ask it, convert this to text. And it'll tr attempt to. But this time, it'll come up with some text that it has not seen. Okay. So you so you created a particular model for that. Yeah. Portion. Correct. Got yeah. It. Right. We, okay. There's not there's, there's not a, a pre-existing right. Amazon recommender model yeah. from Hugging Face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So we have one more question in the middle, and then uh, we'll go to online questions. And we also have t if we have time, uh, can ask the experts as well. Uh, so my question is more about representation and generation. Uh, so specifically to Laura, um, you mentioned about like clip, right? And there's clip, clap, image bind. Do you see these kind of representation models learned separately with some grounding? And then those embeddings like are fixed and used in whatever generative model to generate images like maybe Sora, like image tokens, or like language models, like uh, text tokens, et cetera? Or do you see the future as 
everything together, both representation and the generation happens in the same model, uh, like kind of like Gemini, which where you feed everything in as a token and then you generate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. Um, so right now for research, it's much, much easier to treat the problem separately, right? So we usually take pre-trained models, we don't even touch them, they are frozen, and we just try to extract the knowledge from there, right? And this relates also to the first question, right? This is something that you can do with much less resources. Um, so I think this makes sense. Uh, but also there's, there's another reason for doing that, and that is because the training data that you use for CLIP is not the same one that you're going to use to train, for example, a stable diffusion model that generates the images, right? Um, so I think it's much easier if each system is just optimized for the task that it has to do, and then you just plug them together, right? So, so I think CLIP is already perfect for its purpose, right? And then you can just extract the information and do your generation, do your perception task separately, and you don't need to retrain both models together. This would be a huge overload. Okay, so uh, let's go to uh, some of the online questions. Um, so the first one is, um, how can we get the community more involved in AI for open source technologies? Uh, and what are the most exciting parts uh, and how can we offer this to the community uh, even more. So, Ju, I know you do a lot of work in the open source <laughs> community. Do you want to do you want to tackle that one? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, one thing I can think of is to lower the hardware requirements uh, of the LLMs. So, uh, actually, one of the open source project we're working on. So, unfortunately, it's not available right now, but it, it will be soon. Uh, we are trying to create, you know, to reproduce. The, uh, the use case Chris just mentioned, so the Kaggle Science exam using RAG, and uh, we want to reproduce that solution on the single GPU, uh, specifically like taking tw 20 or 30 something gigabytes of GPU memory, so that you know, it can be run on a single GPU. So uh, in the process, we made several you know, um, uh, improvements, so like uh, FP8 quantization of the uh, language model, and that we use like FEFPQ algorithm to create a vector database so that, you know, uh, Chris mentioned, so we have 65 million text documents. So that translates to something like 110 gigabytes. So uh, with IVFPQ, so our vector database is just the six gigabytes. So um, yeah, so we apply these, we apply, we apply these uh, optimizations, hopefully, so we could create a demo that user could experience with uh, entry level GPU and uh, can reproduce the exact the same solution on uh, you know, like Kaggle kernels or on the uh, Google Colab. So I think that would uh, you know, uh, make it easier for people to start with uh, large language models. Thank you. Um, so we have one more question from the uh, online audience. Um, so what are the most important data science challenges related to LMs that are still unsolved? And which ones do you think will be able to solve? There's still problems with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aware. Um, well, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, share my thoughts and may maybe some of the other panelists ha uh, have theirs. Um, and it goes a little bit to what Julia was just talking about around uh, accessibility. I mean, the models are, are big, they're heavy, they take a long time to, to infer. Um, and there's been a lot of innovations over the past uh, six months, and my gosh, they're coming out every, every week, it seems like now on how we can compress them, make them run faster, uh, make them easier to train, uh, cool training techniques. Uh, but, but we've got to improve the accessibility problem for you know, to get wider adoption and application. And as you can tell from the, the tenor of the talk, we're really interested in application and, and applying these things. And so to me, that, that's the biggest macro challenge, but we're seeing a lot of micro solutions to that, but still a long way to go. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I'll add. So one of the things I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing is, so currently one of the weaknesses of the LLM is sort of mathematical reasoning and, and logic. Uh, they really excel at all, all humanity and social sciences that. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, and then they're constantly doing research in this area. I think a new model was released recently, which actually maybe outperforms ChatGPT on some, mathematic, uh, some mathematical tasks. So I'm looking forward to um, development there. I think we have 
time for uh, questions from the audience. Yeah. Hi. Um, you commented earlier that uh, for calling the competition, it's very important to come up with a creative way to prepare the data. Um, could you share some experience? Uh, what what worked well so far, and what what didn't work well for you uh, from experience? Uh, uh, sorry, the around uh, uh, generating data for. Oh, uh, I think uh, yeah, Ji Wei mentioned right now the uh, cargo competition prone to not providing training data, and oh, it's very critical yeah. to right. for uh, uh, competitors to come up with a way to uh, uh, prepare the data. Could you share yeah. some experience on that? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I think there was a recent computation. It's uh, the LLM assay detection. Mm -hmm. So basically, the task is to uh, detect which essays are written by students in high school and which other uh, essays are written by large language models. Um, so in this computation, uh, I think most, most of the training data provided are, okay, yeah, so are from the, uh, are the, from the real uh, students generated data. So no language, no LLM generated data are provided. Yeah, three, so, three data points. Yeah, three, <laughs> only three examples. <laughs> So participants have to, so they have to uh, experiment with different flavors, I mean different LM families, like the Llama 2 families, the Mistrals, and, uh, you know, and other open source uh, generated uh, essays. And they somehow have to figure out, so which one has the closest like, distribution uh, to the test data. So there's a lot, a lot of analysis going on, like, study the subtleties of uh, you know, the, uh, the LM generated text and trying to figure out, oh, maybe, maybe we sh I should use Mistral. Maybe that's the test data so Kaggle is used to evaluate. I think that's actually a big factor in the final winning solution. Yeah, I think, uh, Dave, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and what I would add to that is, uh, in this case, diversity is king. Uh, you know, the more models you can generate with, the more parameter tuning or, you know, uh, parameter changes you can make, you know, varying, varying temperature. Uh, you, basically, you cannot throw enough data, generated data at the problem because, to some degree, you're, you're guessing what the, the you know, hidden test set or the application set would look like, and, and you don't know. And so when you don't know, the only way to combat it is, you know, just, just flood it with as much diverse data as you possibly can. Hi, thank you for the talk. It's been very insightful. Uh, I am really interested in what you guys were speaking about in terms of multimodality. As what we've seen today, um, text seems to be sort of the gold standard where you're either taking an image and you're creating text from that and then using that as some sort of embedding or you're doing it separately. Every time you go from video to image or image to text, you're losing a lot of information. Now. Is text really the gold standard because we have that as an interface, people typing on keyboards? And do you guys see a future in which the standard might be, I'm asking a question by submitting a video and getting a better response? Or is it really only gonna be text uh, for the foreseeable future? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, maybe you can take that. Um, so. I mean, I don't know, there's so, there's so much that we could discuss here. Um, but I think like there are systems, right, that like, for example, you could imagine regs, right, that work on, you know, um, getting not only the text, but also like a bunch of documents to look into. You can also look into a bunch of images that are retrieved, for example, right? So it's not that your system is just limited to text. It's just that the first step of interacting with a human is so much easier with text that that's how you start with, right? Um, but for example, like we have been working on aligning uh, brain signals with images and with text, and the alignment with images is just much easier, right? So, so text doesn't really describe everything that, that is represented in the brain. Maybe because you're, you're actually looking at a movie, right? You're recording the brain signal, and so the brain signal is just much more correlated with an image, right? Um, so I think, you know, your systems don't necessarily need to go through text, but it's the human input that is so much easier with text. I think, I think that is kind of here to stay. 
but it doesn't mean that in the middle we cannot have other types of connections uh, between images and other modalities. It, it will not necessarily go through text. Yeah, and just sorry, as a quick follow up, yeah. is there a way that you guys have seen effective to go from a low information environment into a high information modality, such as like from text to voice as opposed to the other way around? So sorry to interrupt. I think that's all the time we have. And uh, just a reminder, we have, uh, you, you have the opportunity to meet the experts uh, in this afternoon session as well. So uh, if you have more questions, please feel, feel free to ask the panels. Uh, so let's uh, thank the panel and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining this session. Please remember to fill out the session survey in the GTC app for a chance to win a $50 gift card. If you are staying in the room for the next session, please remain in your seat and have your badge ready to be scanned by our team.